Alrighty. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce this evening's speaker, uh, Don Tai. He is a web developer and a project manager. So, Don, have a go. So my name is Don Tai. I'm an IT project manager, and I'm a webmaster. Uh, a show of hands, who has a website? Ah, okay, quite a few. And who has been hacked? On the website. Many years ago. On the website. Not on the website. Ago. The website has not been hacked. That's no, pretty no. good. That's pretty my, good. My, my personal, personal website. My personal computer's been hacked. Your personal computer's been hacked. Yeah. Oh, okay. Shouldn't the question be how many people know they've been hacked? Very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Right. So today, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do two sides of the same coin. One is the defensive of your website, and the other side is how to hack a website with uh, open source Linux tools. So the defense part is figuring out what is an internet bot, where does it come from, what does it want, and how do you detect it. Um, the detection is pretty important because you want to know if the thing is bad for your website or not. And so I have multiple examples of uh, people who are looking to lay the groundwork, they call it reconnaissance, lay the groundwork to be able to hack your site. And then the offensive is the uh, lovely open source community has provided us with some really great hacking tools which you can use. Uh, they are it is illegal to use these against sites that you don't have control over and you don't have written permission, but uh, the open source community doesn't really limit you in that way. You can just point it to whatever um, website or computer and uh, have, it, have it go at it. So if there's anyone who has any questions, just throw them up and we'll discuss it. And hopefully we'll get through the whole the whole slideshow. Um, so, does everyone know what an internet bot is? An internet bot is a piece of software that is not a human that visits your site or visits your computer. And so, there are many reasons why you would have this automation. One of them, of course, are the search engines. They will go to your site and they will basically scrape all your content and all your images and then throw them up onto like uh, their search engine, which is great. Uh, the other ones that you may not know, there's billions of them out there. We have some, some billion people in the world. There are lots of malicious and non-malicious entities, bots out there that will go to your site and scrape and then what do they do with the content? Who knows? And they're all from all over the world. Some of them will just spam you, which is not so bad, except that you don't really want them there anyway. I, I don't need Russian content on my English-Chinese website, for example. Um, uh, other ones will steal your images. And other ones will try to break into your security, take over your site, uh, put their content into your your Google Google page rank, and and use your site to promote their Viagra or whatever kind of drugs they're trying to sell you. So let's talk about internet traffic. Now, a lot of people think that there's a lot of, it, like the internet traffic is basically human, but uh, humans are not as plentiful as we think. In fact, there's only 48% of the traffic is actually human and the rest of it is from where? These are, these are called bots. So there are good bots and good bots the difference between a good bot and a bad bot is arbitrary. 
uh, you may think Google is good. So you put Google into the good side. And I believe that Baidu is good. So I would put Baidu into the good side. But um, this really depends on how you want to portray your site and what is useful for your, your site alone. So for example, I have bilingual English Chinese content. So I encourage all the Chinese uh, search engines, uh, Baidu, uh, ESO, and many others to come and visit my site. And you might put that, their bots into the bad category because uh, once they get a hold of you, they will scrape you merc mercilessly every day for the rest of your life. So the good and the bad, scraping. Scraping is when you go through every single page and every single piece of content and every single image and basically copy everything back to their server. That is scraping. A good question. Um, and there are the small few who try to break into your site. Um, and how would you know? <laughs> impersonators are bots that they want to pretend that they're human and they want you to pretend you're human. They want you to think that they're human. So there are a lot of bots out there that, that uh, they're, they're basically used to up, up the page, up the, uh, the ad clicks for, um, for various, for their various ads. Yeah. Yeah. In general, the, the whole thing with uh, internet ads with bots is that you have no idea what you're, you're getting when you buy one of these ads. Because these bots, they're, they're everywhere and they will click every single button. So you say you bought 100,000 clicks. Well, what does that mean? Well, a bot just goes off uh, every other day and does 50, 50, 50 clicks or 50,000 clicks every once in a while and you won't know the difference. Okay. So usually they're clicking on websites they control so they get income, right? Yes. Yes. Or maybe not. Uh, these your website, your bot would be clicking on this, and then you'd be referring no, no, to no. the think it, It's your website. You've just bought a uh, uh, an advertisement somewhere else. Okay. And then I'm coming at the other side with your okay. website, you uh, sold the advertisement. And then that yeah. ad, uh, okay. then a yeah. third party comes in and clicks okay. the hundred thousand times you basically bought, uh, yeah. uh, paid for. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it isn't okay. real yeah. humans clicking the ad, uh, the ads, but no. you paid for that. Isn't that? Isn't it often backwards from that? Where I have a website, I'm syndicating ads from somewhere, say Google, or th there's there's a dozen different agents. All of the above. Yeah, all of the above. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, okay. the main rule here is that there are no rules on the internet. Anything is possible. Yeah. There's we have seven billion people in the world. Uh, why these things happen, I've, I've kind of just said, well, it happened and I don't know why. And so we'll have to just live with it. But these things do exist and you might want to track these. The net result is that these bots do affect your site. If you believe that your, your site stats are correct and you don't take into account that these bots are hitting your site, um, you could be uh, sorely mistaken. So um, it's important to go back and, and take a look at what you got and who's coming to your site and if they're human. So what's the main forensic tool that I use for, 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 um, for my own site uh, on an Apache server? It's called a raw access log. And you can get that off your cPanel. And it's basically just this big log. Every time somebody wants some kind of utility or file, any kind of interaction with the server, it'll log it. And so this log can get quite large. But it's a good thing to have because uh, this is the only way you're going to know who goes to your site. 
the front page of your site and you're not going to know unless someone types in a comment other than that you won't know so the raw access log is available for everybody it's really simple to use <clears throat> you just download it unzip it put it into um into calc and uh Pretty nice and simple. So let's see if you can read this. Oh my gosh, it's a little blurry. Okay, <clears throat> we'll go column by column. <clears throat> First column is the IP address. The second column is the date stamp. Third column is what they actually downloaded or what they did. The fourth column is the return code. Is it successful or did, did, you, did, it, uh, did your server uh, deny them? The next column, is that the fourth column? One, two, three, four. The fifth column is how many bytes went back to whomever. The sixth column is the refer. The refer is where did, from what site did that person get to your site? And the last column is a very important column called the uh, user agent. I call it the UA and that tells you or should tell you what kind of browser they used or what kind of bot name they used and this is these two last columns are widely abused so you really can't trust them even the IP address can be spooked so uh, as, as a general rule uh, there are no rules you can change the UA with a little a little uh, plug-in to, to whatever you want and put your name GTA log you can put in whatever you want the refer you can also change your IP address a lot of these bots do change do change them but if they change the IP address whatever that you return from your server is going to go somewhere else and not to the the actual person who who uh, requested it Um, yes, in the third, well, this is your site you're talking about, so you would know if it's SSL or not. You wouldn't necessarily if you're running both. Oh, that's true. I don't run SSL, so. It's generally up to the operator to configure different logs, depending on whether it's SSL or not. Oh, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. Many operators yeah. may combine them. Uh, this comes down to whether you're hosting it to configure it yourself or using a third party. So I do believe that I have an SSL log for my other site, but this one is not SSL, so um, I don't have it. Is this just the generic one that comes with like the raw access log, or did you customize it? There's a couple columns that uh, that were that are always blank. Mm -hmm. um, one is. Um, the the difference the difference in time zone, which is the same all the way down for all all the entries. So I delete that. And there's a couple. There's two. There's, there's two. The username you logged in is. Yeah. I. I don't have. I don't have that. Yeah, then it, then it'll be blank. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, there's three columns that two are blank and one is the time difference, which I delete. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other than that, this is like uh, straight out of the Apache. Is, is this CSP or tab separated? Or? It's CSV, I think. Uh, no. I believe it is. No. Apache, uh, no, Apache isn't. I don't no, know. I just Apache stuck it into not... Calc and it, uh, it, it works for me. <laughs> it, it could be, it could be CSP, CSV. I don't know. I'd say it's tapped a limited, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's actual spaces, but it depends on your web server. Uh, yes, it's can it's it's dramatically configurable. Mm -hmm. And so is the number of columns and the thing that produces. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of what you want. I don't know if there are any more columns uh, after the user agent. Yeah, you can, it can be configured oh. that way. The server can be know, configured that way. As far way. as I know, anything that is in the HTTP spec can actually end up in the raw access. Mm. If you stick with the default. Yeah, you won't get yeah. 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 This, yeah. this yeah. is the if default. This is coming from cPanel. Yeah. If you're using a website that's hosted using cPanel, 
this is what you get. Yeah. Now, apart from this, and I, uh, I have a slide, uh, but I didn't include it, is that you can get uh, HTTP request headers. And what, what you get back is like if there's a cookie and the language and other things like mm -hmm. that, you can also use that to your advantage if you, if you wish, but that's more work for you. Now those things, I've seen ones in the past that showed me where the person came from. So I could see what website they were oh, on. That's a like refer. What's that? Oh, that's okay. a refer. That's the uh, second last column. Yeah. Well, you can't yeah, read it. Yeah, that can it, right? easily be spoofed to those. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you could get country from IP address, sort of. Yes. Uh, uh, that's so pretty it's hard it's now. It it's is, it's yeah. a real IP addresses are in uh, like a patchwork. Uh, like before, it used to be. Before it used to be like Russia was here, and, and now it's uh, all over the place. So, blocks are traded between regions a lot now. So, last column: user agent or UA. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, but one of the UAs there is the letter M. Anyway, any anybody can can use anything for for their user agent, and then the refer is what you were talking about. That's the second last column. Looked at one of those logs lately. Most of those user agents claim they're Mozilla, aren't they? Even though they're not. Uh, yeah, Mozilla is sort of like Smith. Yeah. Uh -huh. Everyone is Mozilla, including Apple. <laughs> yeah, however, they also do. Apple does put in their own little bits in there as well. It's just like it has. It's because well, it's history. Reasons. Yeah. Anything that historically comes from Netscape will will t say it's Mozilla. So pretty much everything except yeah. for those people who actually write their user agent name is Mozilla. <clears throat> so 98% of all the entries that I have are Mozilla. So there'll be Mozilla, Mozilla Apple, Mozilla Huawei. Well, the one that I, I remembered an entertaining uh, Apache access log entry from work from a few months back. And in this one, the user agent was Mozilla 5.0 Macintosh Intel Mac OS X 10.11.1 Apple WebKit, whatever, HTML, like Gecko, Chrome, Safari, scanning for research, and then uh, the websites related to the research project. Yeah, so again, no rules. <laughs> you can do anything. <laughs> Trying to figure out if this user agent is actually a web, uh, a web version is, is actually quite difficult. Different, different countries and different... Uh, different phones, they, they make up their own user agent name. So if there was a standard list of, of user agents, that would be great, but it doesn't exist. And then they lie. Then they lie, yeah. 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 So let's get to humans. I have many friends they're, that are human. Um, they're really nice. They use computers, they come to my site. So you probably don't know why I'm doing this, but Humans, they come from a search engine. So you'll see at the very, well, you can't read it. You'll see at the very top. You'll see at the very top that the, um, the refer is Google. And then after that, you have your content, you have your CSS, you have your, your HTML, and it kind of loads all together. And so you see that um, in terms of the IP address, it's all the same. You don't change IP addresses midway through a request. And your user agent is Mozilla, Ubuntu, X something something, and it's all the same user agent. So you take a look at the timing. The timing is with the same, within the same second uh, or microsecond. Um, there's no jumping around. Uh, there's no... Um, I'm requesting this, but you don't have it. So you get an error 404, uh, nothing like that. Nice and simple, humans love simple. And it's, uh, it's really easy to see who is a human when it comes to your site. So the difference between humans and bots are many. Humans want to read your stuff. Bots, they want to scrape your stuff, take it back to their, their uh, home base and do whatever with it. So 
they want to do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So they're not really, they may not be interested in your CSS or your JavaScript or your fancy pants, other stuff. They just want the content and the images or maybe they want everything. So here's a good bot, you can't read this. Here's a good bot. Uh, this is Bing. You'll see the user agent all has Mozilla, Bing. Oh, you can't read that. <clears throat> User agent, uh, HTTP, Bing.com, Bingbot. The IP address, all the same. Bing doesn't change halfway through. They do like uh, 50 or 60 gets and then they may change over to another IP and then do another 80 gets. But very controlled, very reliable. When you see Bingbot come by, you know that uh, it's, it's a, a good, reliable uh, user agent that, that you would want to keep and hold as a friend. Googlebot, same thing. Well identified. IP address is all the same. They don't mess around. They just basically scrape all your stuff and they bring it back to the home Googlebot uh, place and then they shove it into their search, uh, search, search engine and then away you go. So uh, a nice reliable uh, bot. Uh, unfortunately for Google, uh, Googlebot is the most spoofed uh, user agent out there. So you have to be careful. Like, so if you see a, a huge hunk of and one IP address, then you look it up and it's usually Google. But if they're jumping around like onesies, fivesies, twosies, then you know that some, something's not untoward. So when I see Googlebot like that, I go back to the Project Honeypot uh, site and enter the IP address and say that these people are spoofing uh, Googlebot. So here is uh, an example of a bad bot. It is looking for something and I don't have it, <clears throat> but it's looking for a vulnerability. You can see the, it, it goes all the way through. Uh, the numbers on the side are error 500, which means that uh, my server gave them the boot. But it's looking for things that I don't have. These are called vulnerabilities. They're trying to figure out what software I have. And if they post to my site, will they get a response back? Because if they get a response back, then they know that I have this vulnerability, they can come back later at their own leisure and try to crack my site. Because I banned this IP address because I knew, I knew them beforehand. Sometimes I ban them with, uh, and, and they get 403s or 500s. Internal or server error. <laughs> Internal server error, yeah. 403, uh, uh, does anyone know about these server response oh, yes. codes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so 403 is, I know who you are, I know what you want, but I deny you because you're a jerk. 500 is, I don't know what to do with this thing. 404 is, uh, found not found. Yeah, 500 in everyday use is normally, someone on the site screwed up the script and it crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, does anyone use WordPress? WordPress, great, runs like 70% uh, of the world's sites and it's one of the most heavily, heavily hacked uh, pieces of software out there. So if you use WordPress, be careful, there's a target on your back. So in this case, if you look down at the bottom here, you'll see uh, FCK editor, it's looking for an FCK vulnerability which is a well-known vulnerability, and if you did not patch FCK, you will get hacked through that vector alone. But there are many others there that you can take a look at. Bad bot. Here is an example of, uh, you may not be able to read it, but uh, the refer column, 
someone paid for a website to, I guess, become more popular. They want to be in a lot of people's uh, Google Analytics. And so they use the same refer, and then they use a whole bunch of IP addresses and uh, hit your site with that. Uh, so you can use the refer name to ban them so they won't come back. So let's pay attention to this one. This one is Drupalgeddon. Who has a Drupal site? Just Dave? <coughs> I'm using this example because this is a known vulnerability for Drupal. And uh, it came out uh, this year. And so um, I'll be using this as an example for one of the open source hacking tools to address to, to do this vulnerability. Here is a example of a bad bot that uses the Joomla API to try to hack my site, but I don't have Joomla. So um, these bots are not very smart, or should I say the bot writers are not very smart. They basically just jump from site to site, scrape all the content, and see if something sticks to the wall. And so in this case, they're trying a, a Joomla API. This IP address is from Guangdong, China. I don't even know if they use Joomla in Guangdong, but uh, it doesn't really matter. So you'll see a lot of this stuff. Uh, say you don't run WordPress, you'll see a lot of WordPress exploits uh, hit your server repeatedly, but because they just don't know what you have. Um, another one called Auto Spider. Never heard of it, but it visited me, I banned them. A lot of these user agents you can look up um, on the internet. Uh, some of the code you can actually download from Git, and then you can, you can uh, start up your own bot yourself, if you wish. In general, you don't want people to know who you are as a bot, because if if you can identify if I can identify them, I will ban them. <clears throat> Some bots are legitimate, and so, like Google wants you to know that they're a bot and who they're from. Other bots are not legitimate. <clears throat> right. So you don't know of any good use as far as you're concerned about Auto Right. I did look up Auto Spider on, on Google search. Nothing came up. So I looked up the I look up the IP address. Where is it from? I can't remember. If I can't find a source that tells me what you're doing, this is my site, I'll kick you out. And so that's my general rule. Each person has to make up their own rules. Uh, you may you may allow every and everybody to to get to your site, including uh, all these bad bots. It's up to you. So that's what I do. So before I ban Auto Spider, I try to figure out who it is and if it's worth something to me. If it's not worth anything to me, then I don't let it uh, I don't let it play. So here is. Somebody trying to break into my security. And it is, uh, again, uh, I run a WordPress site. Uh, so it's looking at, at uh, WP login. And it's basically doing repeated attempts at IDs and passwords. All the IPs will be different. Mm -hmm. So WordPress is really special in that it gets this royal treatment of how to hack into the WordPress site. WordPress is special because it has very specific uh, open source software that allows you to put in a vocabulary file and an IP address or uh, a WordPress site and then it just goes at it and it, goes, it can go through 10,000, 20,000 possible combinations until it cracks your site. So if you don't fix this, eventually someone will find a password out of one of your users and crack into your site. 
So the solution to this is double factor authentication, 2FA. So this is what I call the triad attack. It, it basically, uh, you, you can't read that again. Um, it basically goes after uh, WP login, then it says a uh, gate, get HTTP, and then it, it uh, does another get HTTP, and it just does this repeatedly for three or 400 uh, server entries every single day. Thankfully, the user agent had a special code that I put into my um, raw access, uh, um, my HT access to ban it, and then it eventually went away. But that took six months. So every day, it would it would come and hit me for four or five hundred uh, times until it it finally got tired and and uh, went home. No. Yeah. No, it was the user agent was a really weird one with uh, like a, a 10 digit number and I just put the 10 digit number to ban it and uh, mm -hmm. I, I gave it uh, error 403s for probably three months until it went away. Okay. It's like a bad rash. Because I had something similar years ago, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, was how it, did you fix it? Like, the same way, basically, I just uh, ended up banning it and like... But it would still show up. Uh, it still, th this, this bot still shows up for me. Mm. It just doesn't stay very long. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, I just uh, put in a 404, like, uh, file not found. And it, it went away and then never came back. So somebody finally realized that either, like, my server is no longer on, <laughs> online or I've moved. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, this bot... Mm -hmm. You see the amount of IP addresses that it uses? It uh -huh. was using hundreds and hundreds of IP addresses. So if you tried to ban by IP, you would it would it would be futile. I have no idea. Unlikely. No idea what what uh, what its intent was. I've had I've had bots that originated from Indonesia. All the mobile phones just hitting me one at a time, uh, 600, 800 times a day. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I had no idea why. And But they were all internet phones, like sat, sat phones from Indonesia. All the IP addresses came yeah. from there. The most likely thing there is that the satellite phone itself got a, uh, got, uh, got a, uh, Some type a virus. of virus. Yeah, you know, in it, and, that, and that was being used to attack other things. Right, right. Yeah. So why is it visiting me? I don't know. But yeah. these are some of the things that you have to ask God when you die. Uh, yeah. Right now, we, we have no clue. The third category is bots of unknown intent. And what I mean is that, why are they here? What do they want? I have no clue. And one of them that I tracked was the city of Toronto. They have a bot program and I didn't know this. So uh, they were hitting my site, scraping some of my content because I live in Toronto and I uh, might have complained about certain things with the city of Toronto services. And so they searched me up and started putting me on their bot program. Well, naive me, I thought that someone had taken over a city of Toronto IP address and was, was hitting my site with that. So I sent him a little note saying, hey, I think someone has your IP address using uh, a bot. And uh, they wrote back, oh no, it is a quote, prefetch. And so they continue to scrape me on a regular basis. Uh, not too badly, but seeing as that I live in city of Toronto, I let them anyway. Um, all the banks have bots. Every single one of them has visited my site. They have this thing, their, their user agent is compatible with a smiley face at the end. So why they have this smiley face at the end, I have no clue, but all the banks do it. Uh, and, and as well, you can see some like IBM, Apple, they all have bot programs. DuPont, um, Lowe's, 
a lot of the large gro uh, grocery chains and, and retail stores in the US, they all have bot programs. And uh, why do they visit me? Like, I don't know why. I guess the first question you should be asking is why they have a bot program. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I it. asked that. Yeah, and, why uh, would Loblaws need a bot program? No idea. Yeah. No idea. Why does City of Toronto need a bot program? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Uh, Microsoft. We all love Microsoft. Uh, they run Bing. Bing bot comes in well identified. Microsoft as well has spammed me, has tested my security, I have banned IP addresses from them. Why are they doing this even though they're such a, a well-known, supposedly reputable company? I'm not sure, but... Maybe they don't want you in Bing if you feel their security tests. <laughs> maybe, may, maybe, but Google doesn't do that. Google doesn't do that and Apple, Apple bot doesn't uh, attack my security example that I ended up having that might be what they're doing and they're actually testing internal security and it gets out into the wild uh, okay <laughs> it, this has actually happened with me is like it was testing internal security and the firewall was misconfigured and I got a nice little email from sysadmin saying why did you just send me 10,000 of these things <laughs> ah okay so, um, that might be what they're doing, because I can see that happening with Microsoft. Microsoft has tried to hack into my, my uh, ID and password, and uh, I tracked them down. It's a standard uh, Microsoft IP, and why? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, except that we're not in the States, so... <laughs> My, my, my server is from Ann Arbor, Michigan, so uh, technically illegal. They don't know I'm Canadian, but uh, I see them every once in a while doing these naughty things, but you know, I just say, hey, that's Microsoft. They're a little naughty. Um, Are you sure that is then about somebody else's screen? It's definitely a Microsoft IP address, yes. So unless someone has taken over a Microsoft IP address and they, they, they receive back my information to Microsoft, it, it's pretty highly likely that it's Microsoft. Well, they could be spoofing uh, Microsoft's IP address and when you send back a, uh, packets to Microsoft, it gets dropped because there's no, nothing, no connection associated with it. Possible, yes, yeah. that is true. However, over the space of five years, Microsoft is very, very consistent in their naughtiness. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's not a onesies, twosies thing. It's pretty much every other month, I get Microsoft testing my my website security, and uh, so it's like, oh, okay, it's just Microsoft. Uh, let's talk about government agents. Um, uh, as one of my fetishes, I guess I track which government agencies hit my site. So. Uh, uh, Homeland Security visits me every twi two or three times a, a month and I've logged all this on my website because when I see a government agency I just put it in and I know the IP address and, and um, uh, where they came from. So all people in the world, all governments in the world, they go everywhere. So uh, US Army, Navy, uh, the Colombian Air Force has visited me. Weird, weird, weird things have happened, but hey, it's a free world. Uh, veteran Affairs, this guy's just searching around. He wants to uh, know how to fix his lawnmower. He lands on my site, I log it um, on one of my, my website entries. So you get a lot of these really weird, odd things if you, if you happen to look up the IP addresses of some of these, uh, some of these people. But uh, basically, as, as I said before, no rules. People work for governments and they surf on their own. This was, that these were bots versus humans? Like it's, you could tell, oh, these are, this is someone from Department of whatever. I think that these are people who work for like the Department of Corrections in the US and they're bored 
and they're on their lunch hour and they just surf around, but they use they use their government IP addresses. Mm -hmm. And so you know, that that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not even a question. That could be a legitimate use of your Wi-Fi. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It could be legitimate, but it's still a government um, a government uh, yeah. IP address. Mm -hmm. Interesting to note that I've never received anyone from Russia or China using a government IP address to get to my site. They don't do that. They have other ways of uh, hiding themselves in the weeds of... of well, they uh, just use a VPN. Yeah. Well, they could use a VPN, you also yeah. You have to remember in the, 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 the government employee scenario, he might even be using his phone but because he's going through the wireless, you're going to see the government site. Like could be see the IP of like the, the server that, that it's going could to. be yeah yeah so for it's sure. a little more iffy if like if the question is is it a, a bot that the government yeah. is doing versus a human because a human is somebody's actually interested in your site versus hard to say but I get a little nervous when Homeland Security just zooms into like one or two of my my images and it looks like a bomb but it's not that actually probably is like them looking. Oh, that's probably a person for something yeah. who's going through yeah. Google Images and or or some yeah. kind of piece of software that says, "Hey, there's a bunch of wires here. What is that?" And yeah. uh, so, uh, but I log Homeland Security IP addresses, and they do visit, and you should expect them to visit if you have enough weird images that look like bombs. Uh, City of Toronto, here they are. Uh, they have a, a distinct IP range. They have a bot. They may have a person as well, but it's hard to say. But they do, they do uh, have a bot program. So there's a couple countries in the world that have anti-bot legislation in the works. Most of it has to do with um, ticket bots buying tickets and then selling them back for a higher price. Uh, ticket bots, you can buy the software off of the internet for around $350 and then you can run it. However, don't run it in New York. New York is pretty severe. Uh, Ontario is just fine. We have some legislation that just came in, but it seems to be there uh, is some really weird and then selling the tickets via Kijiji. Well, that's that's the whole point. So there's legislation here in Ontario and what happens if your bot's running from Nevada and then selling it back? So it's a difficult problem, but it is bot related. There is legislation. Other countries have tried. The US, Britain, Australia. So it's not for not for um, a lack of a lack of necessity that people have uh, that uh, governments have not tried to control it, but it's it's quite difficult. These are international. These are international uh, bots, and there's a lot of money to be made. So, any other questions about the defensive side of things? Monitoring and banning people. Is there anything else you can really do? Um, I would suggest black hole routing. Uh, if you really know that an IP is a, a particular IP fee is a problem, rather than doing it at the website mm -hmm. level, there are lists of bad user agents that are on the internet. But the problem, and and you could take that huge list. It's it's just a ginormous list of user agents that you can ban. But the problem is that user agents change all the time. It's, it's very fluid. They don't want to be found. So if you have a list of 10,000 user agents from 1960s or, or, well, maybe not 1960s, 1990s, maybe? 1995, thereabouts. Um, it may not be very effective because most of those user agents, they're not being used anymore. And ditto for IP addresses. These companies, they're international companies in that, um, say you'll have something 
out of Italy. They'll buy a range in Russia. And then, so, and then they'll buy a range in, in, uh, in the US. And so they're all under the same company name, but the, uh, the IP address ranges are completely different. So it's basically a game of whack-a-mole. These people don't want to be found, and you want to find them. And so this is, this is the arms race. In general, what you could decide to do, and I have decided to do this, is that certain host providers are just evil. And one of them that I don't like is uh, Amazon. So uh, I found that when I start banning Amazon ranges, there are so many bots. Amazon is like a nest of, of bad... Uh, Yes, so that's the risk you need to take. So, for example, um, face, uh, not Facebook, but um, Pinterest uses, mm -hmm. uses uh, an AWS range. So, I ban the range, which is a huge, huge long range, and then I make a hole for Pinterest. Uh, DuckDuckGo uses Amazon. And so there's a lot of what I would call uh, value-added uh, websites that you want, you want them to come to your site. And so uh, there's the, the decision you need to make. Do you, do you want to um, ban everything? Because not everything is bad. Although there are a couple companies like um, Hudson Valley Hosting, which, which uh, is renowned for, for uh, hosting a lot of these, uh, the bot runners. And so I basically ban the whole range. And I've never needed to change. So you could do that, but that's a value judgment depending on what you want to do. Um, I don't have any Russian content, but do you want to ban all of Russia to your site? You may not have any Chinese content, but do you want to ban 1.4 billion people from possibly there's some people in China that know English and so all these things are value judgments that you need to decide on your own. So the end result is there's no one solution for every single website. And these guys change very quickly. They pop up, they go down. Uh, six months ago, there was a, uh, a, a large contingent from Africa that started popping up and, and spamming me. And then as, as soon as three months later, they all disappeared. Where did they go? I don't know. So uh, and again, a value judgment. Okay, so let's get to the offense. Has anyone hacked into a website? Your own hack website. You've hacked in? Was it your own? No. You don't want to say? It? Okay. <laughs> we won't ask you. Someone puts a password. Come on. They're they're asking for it. You've hacked in? Uh, the old classical hack this site.org. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So, there are tools that are very easy to install where you can hack into a website or you can hack into someone's computer. And doing that without written permission is completely illegal. So, I would recommend that you get a, um, a nice old Windows XP box put it on your internal network and you can try some of this software, but please don't, um, don't go out into the wild and try hacking someone that you don't like because you might get found out. So um, as with anything IT, there is a huge subculture for hacking. Hacking in this case is not adding LEDs to your dress or skirt. Hacking is breaking into a website, defacing it, uh, changing, the, changing the, uh, the admin password so that the other person can't get in, and then using it for your own purposes. So there's, there's a really large, surprisingly large subculture that you can, you can search on all these hacks. Uh, they have a YouTube channel, just like everything else, and um, it's not just uh, North America that uses it. Uh, 
talked about the illegality. So um, the process of hacking into a website, there's reconnaissance. So you want to go to their site, you want to scan their software, you want to see if you can find a vulnerability. Once you figure out the vulnerability, you go back to your software and you find the hack. And then you implement the hack and then you get in. That's generally how the software works. Uh, for phishing and creating root kits, um, the software that we have, open source, you can create a root kit, then you can email it to your friend and have your friend uh, store it on their computer and then you can uh, try to get into their computer that way. Um, there are other ways like uh, phishing that I'm not going to get into. The three that I, the three tools, main tools that I've uh, played with is Nmap, uh, Armitage, and Metasploit. Has anyone used any of these tools? Oh yeah, okay. So which ones have you used? Nmap. Okay. Uh, anyone used Metasploit? Metasploit's pretty cool. I really like it. Um, it's got a huge, huge following. It's open source. There's a huge database, and uh, I, I encourage you to try to uh, download it and and uh, play with it. It's it's uh, really interesting. So here's Nmap. A lot of people have used Nmap. Um, Nmap is basically terminal based. Here is the Nmap command to scan for my internal network and this is what it comes back with. Um, I think Nmap only does the 100 most common ports but you can configure Nmap to do the whole the list. So uh, yeah. yeah this this tool is really cool in that in that um, Sure, it'll give you the top 100, but you can do the whole range if you if you wish, and it'll do a full scan, but it'll take a long, long time. So um, in this case, hmm? the top 100 takes a long time. <laughs> um, on my little laptop, it didn't take too long. Um, I have I have my little list of um, internal internal devices. So um, this 192.168.1.109 is a small uh, Windows XP box that I use for QQ, a Chinese uh, messaging uh, uh, Chinese messaging app. And uh, so this is what Nmap returns. So you can you can see from Nmap that uh, it runs Microsoft software, and from there that's a clue that you can use. To exploit, so now you don't, you know that uh, all the Linux vulnerabilities go away, and you can concentrate on Microsoft, and you can kind of guess that it's a Windows system, right? But that just says is it's running Samba or Microsoft yeah. file sharing? Yeah. Doesn't In say. That actually includes uh, fingerprinting of the OS. If you give it the right switches, it will attempt to compare the fingerprint to a known list tell you what OS it is, and it's usually quite accurate. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, except with Linux. I've, I've, not, I've not had it be so accurate with Linux. But yeah, you're right, I forgot about that. So, you can use Nmap right out of the box in Terminal. <coughs> but someone wrote this GUI front end that incorporates Nmap in, and so uh, it's called Armitage. And you can download it. It's open source for for uh, for a Linux. It's available as is with uh, with Kali. And uh, you basically say scan my network, and it it scans the whole range, and it then puts up these little little computers, which then you can uh, save. You can uh, create a label for it if you know what it is. But it tries. It attempts. It uses Nmap, and it attempts to um, figure out what OS uh, it that that device is. So 
Really simple. You just click on the device that you want to try to hack and uh, it will go through and it'll do an attack analysis of that box, website, phone, or computer. And then from there, it uses the back end of Metasploit to recommend a certain um, exploits that may or may not work. And that's all available in their menuing system. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, the, the tool is available for you to, to play with. And I've played with it, and uh, yeah, it, it, it does work. Then there is the mother load of Metasploit. Metasploit is uh, easily downloadable, open source, uh, really, really, um, Pretty, pretty, a pretty solid hacking tool. Uh, Metasploit will give you access to the vulnerability database. Uh, you can create uh, rootkits with it and send to your friends and loved ones. Uh, and it has a lot of really interesting options. <clears throat> so I've just chosen Drupal as an example, because uh, someone tried to hack into my Drupal site with Drup Drupalgeddon, and so I went into Metasploit and I said, uh, search, search uh, Drupal, and uh, surprisingly, Drupal's been around since, uh, what, 19, oh, 2005? Dave, how long has Drupal been around? So Drupal's been around for a long time, and there's only this many exploits, vulnerabilities in the uh, Metasploit database. I contrast that with WordPress that has, I think it was 480 the last time I counted, uh, multi-screen, you would have been very, very bored with it. There's so many WordPress exploits. So I chose uh, to search for Drupal because uh, I had a hit with Drupal get in. And so there's only, what, eight, eight of them here. So here's how Metasploit works. Uh, you go to the Drupal Geddon one and it says exploit Unix web app Drupal Drupal Geddon 2. And you just do a use that. And then it knows which exploit you are trying to do. So then it gives you a list of options. And one of the options, of course, is who you want to hack. And so uh, you can you can set that option by going um, set our host. Go set our host some IP address, and it will set it. And then uh, once you set up all your options, and these options you should you should research because it's all pretty well documented on the internet in some cubbyhole somewhere, someplace. Uh, so there's a lot of help online for you to be able to um, figure out what to do with these options. And then in the end, you just type in exploit, enter, and away it goes, and you may or may not get into the, to the site. It's that simple. It's really not, uh, not that difficult. So. Here we come to the point of um, who can use these hacks? Well, it turns out that you don't need a lot of computer power. You don't need software. It's pretty inexpensive. So any developing country is on par with any developed country. All you need is Linux, Kali. You download these tools. You have uh, intelligent people that knows what they're doing and know how to get around IP addresses and things like that, and uh, you're in business. So all the small countries like uh, North Korea can, can do this very, very well, and I think they have been very successful at it. Now for me, um, for me, when I try to research a hack, I've tried researching this on, on uh, Baidu, and I find that the information just isn't there. So maybe Google is required to, to, um, 
to get enough background information to do these hacks. But, uh, you know, I don't know. There's a mechanism to use? Um, I tried DuckDuckGo, but they just don't have the depth. Like, for example, when you, when you try to do this uh, Drupal get in thing, what should your, what should your vhost be? Like, do you set the vhost? So, I would put in a question like, um, in DuckDuckGo, Drupal get in hack, metasploit, and would expect that I would get hits on how to set what options so that I don't have to play with it too, too much. And I just find that Dr. Go is not doesn't have that depth, which whereas uh, Google does. But you can try it. So my own successful hack, I I haven't really done a lot of this hacking. I just I just want to know if the thing worked or not. So I took a. Uh, I dusted off an old Windows 98 box and put it into my network, completely unpatched, and uh, I was able to use Metasploit uh, through one of the hacks that I found on the internet uh, with the, uh, the, the, it's a video hack, a video driver vulnerability. And so I was able to uh, add, change, delete any files and uh, take over the whole system, uh, browse at my leisure, but I couldn't, uh, like, I, I had a video camera, a, a, a webcam on there, and I couldn't access that, and I couldn't access the uh, microphone or the speakers. And I, I tried to put a web, web kit, a web root kit onto that computer and, and use it as the vector to get in, and I couldn't figure out how to do that. So um, it's a pretty specialized field of knowledge that that uh, you need to spend a significant amount of time on and I just didn't want to spend that time but at least uh, I got in and I hacked one. Yep. Does that, does that seem to be something like pushing a rootkit onto a machine, do they kind of hide some of the details because well you better you better figure this out for yourself we, we don't want to... Uh, what do you mean hide the details? What you do is you you, you, okay. you don't tell your friend that it's a rootkit. <laughs> you say, oh, it's just this file, and can you put it on your computer? Because like, uh, it's, it's important. And then you just put it on, and then you use that. that. You want to go ahead? Um, I think the question is, does the Metasploit community try to obfuscate the content of their exploits? Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't believe the answer is. Uh, Absolutely yes. I, not. I, I think they just. They put it out there, and if you actually dig into the source code, the exploits, you can learn how it actually works. Okay. They're pretty open about the whole thing. In fact, um, if you really wanted to, and if you had enough, if you had enough smarts, you can add to the Metasploit database because uh, there's a there's a language that you can use that you can put together your own exploits and add them in once it gets approved. They're very open about it. Yeah. No, I haven't got any actual basis for this, but I believe Windows 98 is crafty enough that you can find an exploit in the next year of the free code. Then it's a small matter of programming, of building your own new kit and putting it on, or finding one that you're custom. So I, I believe once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, yeah, you can you can put uh, any code in there, and I and I. It's just that Metasploit probably doesn't have what you want. If you just. <coughs> well, Metasploit can actually create the rootkit file, and then you can put that rootkit file into that computer. If you've already hacked into it, you just put it into some directory somewhere, and then at your leisure, you can come back and and use that rootkit uh, to get as the vector to get into that computer again. Yeah. Yeah, I tried that. I, it, it just well, takes hours and hours no, to try to figure out. That will not work because you went through the video driver vulnerability and it probably crashed the video driver. That, that took you get left you in a basically the DOS prompt. 
this yeah. is a, a large tangent that could go yeah. forever. I know. Forever, yeah. Uh, yeah. This takes a lot of time. If you really want to waste a huge, huge amount of time, this is a really interesting place to, to play. There's a lot of people on the internet that, uh, that do this, and I, I'm not one of them. I just tried it once and just to see if it, uh, it works, and I thought Metasploit was pretty cool, and so, yeah, I went, I, I went at it. But once I hacked into my little, little computer, it was like, oh, that's enough for me. Like, the thing works. I did hack in, and then I'm not really interested in going out into the wild and trying my luck with uh, the RCMP. So if you try this with your friend and you do not have written permission, this is bad. Don't do this. The tool is there for good or evil. It's open source. It's an easy download. It updates very, very nicely. Um, I've had uh, Metasploit and, and, uh, and uh, Armitage for a couple of years and uh, it's, it's, really, it's really good. Uh, don't hack into my site. If I find your IP address and you're doing something, I will ban you. <laughs> and I do it from the library. <laughs> <laughs> in the library. <laughs> random coffee shops for me. <laughs> yeah, I was I was thinking of going to a random coffee shop or the library and setting up my uh, my uh, Armitage and just letting it run and trying to see how many people are in my library and what 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 uh, phones and and people are there but I think that is illegal and then then doing think anything else on it it would be illegal so collecting the data isn't illegal Oh, I wouldn't collect it. I would just go there with my Armitage and try to hack into people's phones while I'm there. But after... The trying to no, hack but, into no, is the, the trying to hack yeah. into. But yeah. if you just you know, went with Armitage and just ran like the, the scanning and to find all the vulnerabilities, that isn't illegal. Uh, might be. Uh, no, Maybe. actually. Mm -hmm. Not under the privacy laws, I don't think. Well, I'm going to try this when I get home tonight. You know, you're <laughs> so close. You've, you've, you've done the, the, the reconnaissance. Yeah. You know their operating system. That's where the line is. Yeah. But That's the line. <laughs> Armitage has shown you these lists of vulnerabilities. All you need to do is put your little mousey follow it out over there and hit click and then you know off and it that's where you violate the law <laughs> but if, if you do right. this in a bar somewhere you probably probably don't know what you're doing if you do this in the central reference library that maybe their ip staff know what they're doing they'll see it uh, yeah so uh, go uh, there <laughs> <laughs> okay now you're there's a theory that. there <laughs> yeah based off you know, my experience oh, at the library yes. oh okay yeah armitage and metasploit makes it so easy so convenient to cross that line <laughs> so convenient can everything hide, is there can you hide your computer from, I've got my laptop set so that it doesn't respond to pain would it be invisible to this stuff or I'll find out when I get home tonight I guess well if you're on their network you have an IP address uh, yeah. if you didn't have an IP address you wouldn't be able to to go out and use Nmap yeah, so right. yeah, you yeah. would need an IP and address Nmap would just search the, you know all of your the open ports okay so it would return yeah. you know here are the 20 open ports, for example. Yeah. Yeah. There's a ping return. Uh -huh. You can override that, but that's yeah. default. Uh -huh. And yeah. if you're using Linux, uh, when you ping most of these, I've tried to, to, to hack into these Linux boxes, even old ones like uh, Puppy Linux, and they don't give up anything. These these Linux boxes are just, they're, they're solid. Nothing comes sure. back. It's like this vacuum that sucks in all the all, all the ex, uh, all, all the pings and yeah. like nothing nothing gets returned when, when I install Fedora I've got to install a, a script under rt.local to disable ping I've got to go I had to just go to some effort to do it I mean it's easy to do I just had to figure it out I've tried to like I have uh, Ubuntu 16.04 I've tried to, um, to figure out like use meta, uh, uh, Armitage to figure out what box it is, it won't even tell me what box it is. 
It just, just says, well, I don't know what it is. And none of the ports are open, none of them respond, and it's just like a black hole. So uh, kudos to the Linux kernel for making it so hard to hack into. But uh, if you go to the library, I don't, I don't think that they have any sophisticated security that would prevent you from hacking into other people's computers. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the last thing is, um, we always talk about this illegal stuff, but there's a, another industry called penetration testing that uses the same exact tools, except that they pay you, they pay you money for your job and uh, you don't go to jail. So uh, that's called penetration testing if you're, if you're interested. And that's pretty much it. Any other questions? Who's gonna? Who's gonna oh yes, go ahead. Uh, you said that you use WordPress, and you uh, more or less implied that Amazon's hosting is not as good. Amazon, oh. AWS hosts a hotbed of legal activity bots. Yeah. Do you recommend any hosting companies? Uh, Dave? It's, it's not about the hosting companies. It, 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 if you have WordPress maintenance, you have to do all the maintenance all the time. And use as few plugins as you can because they tend to be the worst holes. Mm -hmm. Are you wanting to know how to make WordPress a little bit less vulnerable? I have no idea. I may have had an account on WordPress for some reason at some time, and I have known people who do. That's about all I can say. Okay, that's pretty general. Okay, um, if you use WordPress, WordPress is really easy for regular people to, to use. It's very simple. You can get your website up. There's a five minute install on wordpress.com. Really nice. However, in self-hosting, most of these WordPress sites are open. And if you have your admin password as a grandmother, someone will hack into your site by using some of these tools. So make sure that you have a nice large name and I would also recommend uh, two-factor authentication so that brute, brute forces attacks will just, you'll just get returned. I was in a, a place I worked a couple years that had two-factor authentication they, and we were all issued a USB chip stick and we had, to stick it in, we had to stick it in the port and we would log in and then we had to hit the button on the USB thing and that mm -hmm. threw another code into it and that got us locked in. Uh, so mostly do do today that? it's uh, via a cell phone, so uh, you log in, it will send you a, a one-time pad which you yeah. then will go to and log, uh, and okay. put it in. I know, I've, I run a hiking club website and if I go in on their, on their web interface and the IP address is not the same as it was last time, it throws up the security questions. Mm -hmm. And of mm. course, my grandmother's maiden name is Vonka Rotary Engine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my two-factor authentication uh, for my Apache server is basically uh, server-based. So you set up a, um, uh, a password file, and then you store the password file there, and then you put in to your HT access um, that y you use this password file. And so anyone who wants to get into that website needs that same ID and a password. Otherwise, it doesn't get in. And then you are allowed to then log in with your WordPress ID and password so that uh, if you have a bot, they won't know that server ID password. And so that stops them even before it hits your WordPress site. So that's how I know how to do it through, through uh, Apache. And Dave, you do, it, you do the same. Yeah. Yeah, two-factor authentication with WordPress is pretty much mandatory. I, otherwise, you're, you're guaranteed you're going to get hacked. There's a, 
a piece of software, again, open, I think it's open source, but it's uh, made from Python, it's called uh, WP Secu, WP Security, and um, they, they have this write-up and they, they say, here's how to hack into a WordPress site, go to this place and you can, or you can just search on Google for a vocabulary, a vocabulary list, and then you just tell WP Secu to do X thousands of iterations on someone's site and it'll just cycle through the various uh, vocabulary lists and just try it. Like the web, uh, running a couple websites is basically the dumb websites. There's no scripting or anything like that. And well, what's, so, it, what's it written in? Uh, HTML. HTML. HTML, right. <laughs> I.e. No script, there's, no, there's no scripting whatsoever. It's just straight. Right. Um, you go on the page, there's an index.html, and that, that's the URL, and then you click from there. Um, so I'm going up to, I'm uploading through FTP. At one point, the hiking club site had the FTP disabled, and I had to do it with the web interface. So it's re-enabled again, um, which means they don't get hit with the security questions if, they, if the IP address is different. So there's no, there's no interactivity. Right. There's no login. Well, that's really. Oh, sorry, there's a lot. There's a login, and I've got a strong password. It's HTTP. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. So they can snip it. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. Conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And just yeah. getting to be approximately near time. Near conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's there's different <laughs> there's different levels of vulnerability. I think WordPress is at the very very top. Yeah. And then you have your your uh, flat file, your flat file CMSs, and they're a little bit less vulnerable. And then you go down, and basically the most secure is like HTML, like Static. single line coding. No one hacks that, and even if they do, you just upload it again, and you're fine. So, if you're okay with what what year? Nine, yeah, straight HTML, 1980. No, no, 90s, 1990s, 1990s, 1990s HTML. <laughs> you're good. You don't have to worry about all this stuff. Like it's X, X HTML, but there's no there's no script attached to it. No script attached to it. Yes. So it's right. More modern than that. I've seen some cool stuff in HTML5, but I'm assuming it's going to be about five years before all the browsers can be trusted to support it. That's a problem. Yeah. When you were talking about people running thousands of runs, is um, trying to connect thousands of times, is this? Are they exhaustively trying different passwords? Yes, they use the, uh, yeah. the okay. they, they use the vocabulary um, so, file and they have different yeah. combinations that strung okay. together. There's, there's an algorithm for it. Okay, so, so if so my word on my WordPress site, I'm using an actually randomly generated string. Then they won't be able there's, to there's, get there's, through there's, it. Uh, un not unless it just so paper. happens to hit a hash collision. Uh, yeah. yeah. If your password is my dog is brown, they're gonna get it. But if you if you oh, <laughs> but if you use a a hashed password that you put into a password program, they're not gonna be able to to get into that. Well, the bots unless won't I, be able to unless they encounter hash collision. Yes. That's it. Okay, we're done. Okay. Yay. Thank you.